Salam alaikum à toutes et à tous. Bienvenue ce soir euh, à cette conférence inédite. Inédite parce qu'aujourd'hui, pour la première fois euh, dans l'histoire de notre Jamaat français, et grâce à la collaboration entre la Jamaat de Bagneux, de la Courneuve et de Madagascar, nous avons l'honneur d'accueillir parmi nous un orateur très renommé dans le monde chia, en la personne de Sheikh Azhar Nasser. Donc, euh, avant de commencer, euh, je vais brièvement vous présenter euh, Sheikh Azhar Nasser et son parcours, afin que nous le connaissions un petit peu mieux. Donc, Sheikh Azhar Nasser est né et a été élevé euh, aux États-Unis, dans l'État du Michigan, où euh, il a notamment obtenu un diplôme de l'Université du, Mi du Michigan en anthropologie. Après avoir fini son parcours académique aux États-Unis, il est notamment allé, allé étudier au Hausa de Najaf, sous le fils de Ayatollah Sistani et Ayatollah Hakim. Et là-bas, il a euh, en particulier étudié les textes euh, religieux classiques, ainsi que euh, le Coran. Il a ensuite enseigné euh, des cours introductifs euh, en sciences religieuses euh, à des élèves euh, en Occident. Et il a notamment écrit deux livres. Le premier qui s'intitule « Un grand tour les, des descriptions » coranique du paradis, et le deuxième qui s'appelle Prescription spirituelle, qui ont été publiés tous les deux en 2018 et en 2019. C'est également le cofondateur du Tasnim Institute, euh, dont le but est de propager le savoir islamique euh, au plus grand nombre. Donc ce soir, euh, nous avons la chance de l'avoir euh, parmi nous, c'est une grande première, euh, pour une conférence qui sera immédiatement suivie ensuite euh, d'une session de questions-réponses. Euh, pour laquelle nous espérons que vous, aurez, que, que vous aurez beaucoup de questions à lui poser pour profiter de cette opportunité. Donc, euh, dès à présent, vous pouvez, si vous avez déjà des questions, les envoyer. Donc, il y a trois façons de le faire. Soit euh, en vous servant du numéro qui s'affiche à l'écran, soit en utilisant le QR code, ou encore euh, sur mefilezenob.com slash poser une question. Euh, avant de commencer euh, la conférence de ce soir, euh, conférence qui sera sur le thème de euh, la préparation spirituelle pour le mois de Ramadan. Euh, je voudrais que euh, nous n'oublions pas nos malhumin et euh, je vous invite tous à réciter un surat al-Fatiha pour marhuma Zeraban ou Kasimali ainsi que pour tous nos malhumin. Surat al-Fatiha. إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد. So Sheikh, thank you so much for being with us tonight, and uh, I'll let you uh, start with uh, the conference. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين Respected elders, my dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, I'd like to begin by uh, extending my, my gratitude uh, to the organizers of this conference Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward all of you for your efforts in organizing this very important discussion, you know, as we approach the, the holy month of Ramadan. I know that, you know, there's a lot of hard work that goes on behind the scenes. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards all of those who did all of the little things behind the scenes uh, to make this program possible today. So we are only uh, a couple of days away from the blessed month of Ramadan and we've been preparing or at least uh, we were supposed to be preparing for the arrival of this month uh, in the month of Rajab and Sha'ban and I thought it would be uh, beneficial to share some uh, reflections at least during the first part of my presentation to share some reflections on the famous uh, khutbah of the Prophet 
as many of you know, my dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet Sallallahu he delivered what is probably the most comprehensive description of the virtues of the month of Ramadan during his last Friday, in the last Friday uh, in the month of Sha'ban. Now it's not clear what, what year this was, but we know for certain that in one of the years, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, de he delivered a detailed, uh, comprehensive talk on the merits of the month of Ramadan. And I think if we reflect on some of the introductory remarks of the Prophet in this khutbah, it will allow us to enter this sacred month with the right mindset. Now, before I begin with uh, the reflection on the khutbah of the Prophet, it, it's important for us to understand that the month of Ramadan, you know, the month of Ramadan is basically a, a period of time. It's important that we understand that time from an Islamic perspective is not just a mental construct. The month of Ramadan is something that has a reality. It's not just something that exists in our minds in terms of, okay, it's, it's just a period of time. In fact, in the Islamic tradition, everything has awareness. Everything has a reality. If you look at the, the du'as, the supplications of Imam Zain al-Abideen in Sahifa al-Sajjadiyya, he has a du'a where he welcomes the month of Ramadan, and he also has a du'a where he farewells the month of Ramadan. And for example, if you look at his du'a where he farewells the month of Ramadan, the Imam alayhi salam, he actually sends salam to the month of Ramadan. If the month of Ramadan was simply a mental construct that had no external reality, why would the Imam alayhi salam say salam to this month? The Imam is not going to say salam to something that lacks awareness. So for example, Imam Zain al-Abideen, in his farewell dua of the month of Ramadan, he says, As-salamu alayka ya akrama mas'ubin min al-awqat. Imam al-Sajjad, he says, peace be upon you. He's speaking to the month of Ramadan. O oh, most noble of accompanying times. وَيَا خَيْرَ شَهْرٍ مِنَ الْأَيَّامِ وَالسَّعَاتِ Peace be upon you, O oh, the best of months in days and hours. السلام عليك من شهر قربت فيه الآمال Peace be upon you, O oh, the month in which our hopes and our expectations come very close. They draw near. So number one, brothers and sisters, we have to realize that these sacred times, they have a reality. They are real things. Jumu'ah is something that is real. It's not just a, an abstract concept. The month of Ramadan will bear witness on the Day of Judgment against us or for us, saying that such and such person honored me. And maybe such and such person neglected my value, neglect, neglected my right. So the fact that we have du'as where Ahlul Bayt are saying salam to, Ahlul, to the month of Ramadan indicates that the month of Ramadan is something that is very real. It's not just an idea. It's not an abstract concept. It's not a mental construct. So if we reflect on the Prophet's month of Ramadan sermon, the narration, the, sur the khutbah is reported to us by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he says that the Prophet stood on the last Friday in the month of Sha'ban and he began addressing the Muslims. Ayyuhan nas, O people, innahu qad aqbala ilaykum shahrullah. 
He says that the month of Allah is approaching you. You know, he, the Prophet is describing this month as though it is a noble guest that is about to arrive. That it is approaching. You're not approaching the month of Ramadan. No, the month of Ramadan is approaching you. It's as though it is this noble being that is about to descend in our presence. And the Prophet says that this is Shahrullah. Now, of course, all time is created by Allah. Every month is Shahrullah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ascribed this month to himself because of the great blessings that he offers to his servants in this month. Just like, you know, every house is the house of God because all of the material that is used to build any house on earth, it belongs to Allah. But the Kaaba, Allah says, this is my house. He ascribes it to himself. Why? Because of the great blessings and the sanctity and the mercy that envelopes that area. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he ascribes this month to himself. He says, this is my month. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he gives three descriptions of the month of Ramadan. He gives three descriptions to this month, three adjectives. The Prophet, he mentions three adjectives. And my dear brothers and sisters, the Prophet is very precise with his words. The Prophet ﷺ is very particular about the words that he chooses. It's not random. The one who's speaking is not someone who is inaccurate or imprecise. Every word that is mentioned has oceans of meaning. The first description of the month of Ramadan is that it is a month of barakah. Now the word barakah is often translated as blessings. It is the month of that carries with it blessings. Now what does it mean? What is, what is the meaning of the word barakah? If we look at the, the Arabic dictionaries, especially those, the, the classical Arabic dictionaries, we find that the word baraka, it has a very specific meaning. It is thubu, as the, as the linguists say, it is thubu tul khayl, wa dawamu. It is when goodness is fixed. And it is a goodness that endures. It remains. And the idea here is that what we receive in the month of Ramadan, what we do in the month of Ramadan, it is fixed for us and it remains. It's not something, see what we do in the month of Ramadan, it doesn't just happen and then it goes away. The effect of it dwindles or diminishes. What we do in the month of Ramadan, it remains for us. It endures. It lasts. There could be one Ramadan that changes the trajectory of your entire life. There are things that maybe we are enjoying in our lives today that are the result of what we did in the month of Ramadan 10 years ago. Maybe there was a, Ramad a month of Ramadan 10, 15 years ago that I am today still reaping the benefits of it. So the khair, the goodness of the month of Ramadan, it continues, it endures. So baraka means thubutul khair wa dawamu aw kathratul khair wa ziyadatu or it means an abundance of goodness and it refers to something that grows, something that continues to grow. You know, sometimes in other months we might do something and it doesn't last it doesn't have a lasting impact but the month of ramadan is the month of barakah what we do is amplified it is preserved it endures it's like a seed 
a seed that is planted and you water it and it continues to offer fruits. So that's why, my dear brothers and sisters, every month of Ramadan is precious for us because it's a month of barakah. Every month of Ramadan is an opportunity to completely change the future of your life. It has a very lasting effect. So the Prophet Sallallahu the first description that he gives of the month of Ramadan is that it is a month of barakah. It's a month that has a lasting impact on a person's life. It can benefit, it benefits you in the remaining years that you have in this world, and it continues to benefit you. What you do in this month will continue to benefit you. After death, in the grave, in Alamul Barzakh, on the day of judgment. And even in Jannah, you will continue to reap the benefits of what you did in these blessed months. So the Prophet says, it is the month of Barakah. إِنَّهُ قَدْ أَقْبَلَ إِلَيْكُمْ شَهْرُ اللَّهِ بِالْبَرَكَةِ Number one, وَالرَّحْمَةِ The second description of the month of Ramadan is that it is the month of Rahmah. It's the month of mercy. Now, brothers and sisters, we all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim in every month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always merciful. Every month, to a certain degree, is a month of Rahmah. The month of Sha'ban is the month of Rahmah. The month of Rajab is the month of Rahmah. The month of Muharram is the month of Rahmah. Every month is the month of Rahmah. Because Allah is there. Allah is He's present in every month. But what is the difference between the month of Ramadan and other months? The difference is that, yes, Allah's mercy is available in every month. But the amount of mercy that is available to us in the month of Ramadan is greater than any month. You know, if you want to look at it from an economic lens, you know, we always speak about supply and demand. The supply of Rahmah in the month of Ramadan is unlimited. There is no restrictions on it. Whereas it's going to depend. It's going to depend how much capacity you have to take from this unlimited supply. So on Allah's side, there is no, it's, it's un unlimited supply. But on our side, the question we have to ask ourselves is, how much capacity do I have to take from this rahm? You know, imagine you're standing in front of a vast ocean. And you want to take, you want to take some water from this ocean. What you take is going to depend on the size of your vessel. There might be someone who doesn't have a cup with him. He can just take whatever he can collect with his hands. There are those who come better prepared. They might come with a cup. And they take to the extent that this cup can hold. They take based on the capacity of the cup. And there are those who have a greater capacity. They were more well prepared. They come with a bucket. And they take a bucket of water. And they take only a bucket because that is all that they can take. That is their capacity. And there are those who come with you know, huge containers and they take more. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not that Allah doesn't give. Allah has unlimited supply. The question is, how much are you able to carry with you? How much are you able to take? And the size of your vessel is going to depend on your spiritual heart. You know, whenever we commit sins, our capacity to receive rahmah from Allah becomes limited. The more obedient we are to Allah, the more our hearts expand and we can receive more. You know, this is why doing wajib and avoiding haram is very important. Because wajibat, they increase your capacity to receive rahmah from Allah. And sins restrict your capacity to receive that special mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's the month of Rahmah, brothers and sisters. So as we enter this month, 
we have to remember that this is a unique opportunity. The supply of divine mercy is unlimited. You take as much as you want, as much as you can take. And then it's also the month of Maghfirah. أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّهُ قَدْ أَقْبَلَ إِلَيْكُمْ شَهْرُ اللَّهِ بِالْبَرَكَةِ وَالرَّحْمَةِ وَالْمَغْفِرَةِ It's the month of forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is one aspect of Allah's rahma. Forgiveness is not something different from rahma. It's one dimension of Allah's rahma. It's one manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahma. And this is an example of atful al khas al al am. Rahma is general, and maghfirah is a specific instance of rahma. And the Prophet, he singles it out among all of the different types of mercy. He mentions this specifically, he mentions maghfirah specifically. Why? Because it is the most important manifestation of, of Allah's rahmah for us. The greatest thing that Allah can give us in the month of Ramadan is to forgive us for our mistakes, is to pardon us for our shortcomings. This is the most important thing. That's why the Prophet he says, Inna shaqiyya man hurima ghufran Allah fi hadha shahr al -azim. The most wretched person, the biggest loser, is the one who experiences and goes through the entire month of Ramadan and they do not earn the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is such a, a lost opportunity. So the Prophet in these, these words, he's essentially saying that the month of Ramadan can fix your future. Because it's a month of barakah. It's a month that can have a lasting effect on the rest of your life. And it's the month in which you can fix your past through maghfirah. So this is a very unique month, brothers and sisters. And it's all, it all revolves around rahmah. Out of Allah's rahmah, whatever you do in this month can forever change your life. And it is out of Allah's rahmah that in this month, he can forgive you of all of the things that you did in your past. So the month of Ramadan is the month in which we have this golden opportunity to build our future and to fix and rectify our past. And between Barakah and Maghfirah is Rahma. Rahma is in the middle because it is the center of everything. Everything revolves around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah. And then the Prophet, he says, he says, Shahrun huwa indallahi afdalu shuhur. A month with Allah is considered, is the best of months. With Allah, the month of Ramadan in the sight of God is the best of all months. Now, for you and I, the month of Ramadan, yes, Allah considers it the best of months, but you and I, we might not consider the month of Ramadan the best of months. For some people, the best of all months is the summertime, where they don't have school or they don't have to go to work. They get a little bit of a break. For many of us, deep down in our hearts, we don't really treat the month of Ramadan as the best month. We don't feel that joy and that yearning for the month of Ramadan. Many, many might, but there are some that probably don't. Maybe the best of months to us is the month in which I make the most money. My business generates the most profit. So maybe deep in my heart, I feel that the best month is the month in which I make the most profit. Or the month in which I get to celebrate my birthday, or the month in which I get to you know, celebrate my anniversary, whatever it may be. But the best month in the sight of Allah, the best month for us, according to Allah, is the month of Ramadan. Because the month of Ramadan 
is the month that can, can, that can completely change your life. There is no month that can transform you like the month of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when, when He decrees that this month is the best month, it's because Allah is looking at your entire journey. He's looking at what is going to help you get to Jannah the fastest. It's the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is the most important for you, for you and I. To Allah, everything is, Allah is the creator of all time. But this month, He has decreed that this month is the best month for you and I. Why is it the best month? And of course, you know, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, that it is the best of months. وَأَيَّامُهُ أَفْضَلُ الْأَيَّامِ And its days are the best of days. وَلَيَالِهِ أَفْضَلُ الْلَيَالِ And its nights are the best of nights. وَسَاعَاتُهُ أَفْضَلُ السَّاعَاتِ And its hours are the best of hours. You see, brothers and sisters, the month of Ramadan, as a whole, it is the best of months. But even its Parts are the best of parts. You know, sometimes you might have a house. Let's say that there's a house that's considered the best house, the most luxurious house. Now, yes, as a whole, it might be the best of houses. But that doesn't mean that every little thing in the house is the best of its kind. So, for example, there might be a palace. But that doesn't mean that you know, the, the outlets in that house are the best of outlets. Or the doorknobs are the best of doorknobs. Maybe there's a lesser house that has better doorknobs, that has better outlets, that has a nicer garden. So, the, the month of Ramadan is not only the best as a whole, it's also the best even in terms of its parts. It's the best of months, but it's not only the best of months. Every night in the month of Ramadan is better than any other night. And any day in the month of Ramadan is better than any other day. And any hour in the month of Ramadan is better than any hour at another part of the, the year. So it's the best in terms of its whole, and it's the best in terms of its parts. There's nothing that can match it. And then... The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, he explains that, why, what is so special about this month? It is a month in which you have been invited by Allah Subhanahu Wa You have been invited to Allah's banquet. Diyafatillah. Allah has invited you to attend a divine banquet. وَجُعِلْتُمْ فِيهِ مِنْ أَهْلِ كَرَامَةِ اللَّهِ In the month of Ramadan, Allah has put Himself in the position of a host. And He has invited all people. He has invited everyone as His guest. And not only are you a guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you are his honored guests. You know, brothers and sisters, the religion of Islam places great emphasis on the importance of honoring our guests. We have many ahadith of, from the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt that teach us that when we have guests, we should treat them generously. We should tend to our guests. We should honor our guests. Whether those guests are invited guests or uninvited guests. You know, sometimes we have guests who come unannounced. Someone knocks on the door, suddenly we have guests. We didn't, we didn't invite them, but they ended up coming. So we have invited guests and we have uninvited guests. Even if you have an uninvited guest, Islam teaches us that we should still 
welcome them into our homes. We should offer them hospitality. In fact, the Quran tells us about how Ibrahim treated his uninvited guests. For example, in Surah al dhariyat Ayah 24, Surah 51, verse 24 onward. Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Hal ataka hadithu dhayfi Ibrahim al-Mukramin? Have you not? Has the story of the honored guests of Ibrahim come to you? Have you heard of the story of the honored guests of Ibrahim? Allah is asking this rhetorical question. إِذْ دَخَلُوا عَلَيْهِ فَقَالُوا سَلَامًا قَالَ سَلَامٌ قَوْمٌ مُنْكَرُونَ the guests were actually angels. They showed up unannounced, uninvited. They were angels in human form. They came and they greeted Ibrahim. Ibrahim reciprocated with a better greeting. He welcomed them into his home. فَرَاغَ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهِ فَجَاءَ بِعِجْلٍ سَمِينٍ He goes... And he brings a fat roasted calf. He offers the best meat that he has to his guests. Now Ibrahim alayhi salam, of course, he's not eating, you know, roasted calf every day. No, he brings the best of what he has and presents it as food for his guests. And as I said, brothers and sisters, these guests were uninvited. They were unannounced. Yet Ibrahim alayhi salam, he shows them the best hospitality. He greets them. He welcomes them into his home. He, sat, he slaughters the best calf that he has, the fattest calf, the most delicious food. He gives it to them. Now my question for you is, my dear brothers and sisters, if this is how Ibrahim alayhi salam treats his uninvited guests, whereby he gives them the best that he has, how do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will treat his invited guests? Allah in the month of Ramadan, he's inviting us. We're not his uninvited guests. We are his honored guests whom he himself has invited. Now what does it mean when we say that we are the invited guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The prophets didn't say that Allah in the month of Ramadan, he only, he's only inviting mu'mineen, or he's only inviting muttaqeen, or he's only inviting the saints, and the pious, and the righteous people. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his invitation is for all people. The sinners and the saints. Those who are close to him and those who have taken themselves far away from him. What does it mean when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has invited us as his guests? What it means, brothers and sisters, is that each and every one of us is very dear to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not invite you and he would not take it upon himself to be your host because the host is essentially saying that I am at the service of my guests. I want to make you comfortable. I want to honor you. I want to start a new page with you. Some of us, maybe we've made a lot of mistakes. We don't have a relationship with Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though he's the Lord of the worlds, even though he's the Almighty, even though he doesn't need us, Allah has initiated this relationship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is coming after us and he's saying, come, be my guest. I want to be your host. This means that Allah considered us, considers us dear to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his servants. Now, when you are a host, 
you don't ask your guest to bring anything with them. You know, if if I'm hosting a dinner at my house, would it be polite for me to say to my guests, bring your own food? This would be considered highly disrespectful. I don't expect anything from my guests. I just want them to come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants us to show up. He says, come, be my guest. And a guest, a host offers the best of what he has for his guest. You know, that's why, you know, I remember growing up, we used to always uh, be excited. We would be excited if our parents had invited guests. Because we know that the dinner is going to be the best. We're going to have the best food and the best desserts. Why? Because the food that we serve when we have guests is always better than the ordinary food that we eat when we don't have guests. We show that extra hospitality. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan, because He is the host and we are His guests, that means He is going to give us things that are not usually available. And what are those things that are not usually available? When we come to Allah's banquet, He says, أَنْفَاسُكُمْ فِيهِ تَسْبِيحِ Your breaths, your breathing is considered, it's counted as glorification. In other months, your breathing is not considered tasbih. But because you are Allah's guest, Allah is giving you something special. And that is that just breathing, just being a guest, Allah appreciates even your breathing. Because that is how a generous host is. A generous host is just happy to have people in his home. So our breath, just breathing, as Allah's guest, Allah says, I'll reward you just for breathing. In other months, your sleep is not considered worship. But because you are Allah's guest, and Allah is your host, He says that even your breathing, I count it as worship. I appreciate it. You know, it's like when you have a guest and your guest says, I'm a little bit tired. Can I take a nap? You, Especially if this is someone that you invited, someone who is dear to you, you'll be very honored to give them a quiet bedroom for them to rest. In fact, you will appreciate that your guest feels so comfortable that they want to sleep in your home. You would appreciate that. Allah is the same way. In the month of Ramadan, when we sleep, Allah says, I appreciate that. You're my guest. And I'll reward you even just for sleeping as my guest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're Allah's guest. We're all Allah's guests. Whatever you do is accepted. Whatever you offer is accepted. It is highly appreciated. You know, have you ever seen, especially if you've hosted guests in your home and your guests, they finish their dinner, especially if they're very polite and good-mannered guests, they usually will try to pick up their plate and take it to the kitchen and put the, the dirty plate inside of the sink. Now, as the host, you want to stop them. You don't want them to do anything. You, you don't want them to trouble themselves. In fact, anything, just that gesture that they make to take their own dish. They're not going to wash the dish. Just, just taking their dish to the kitchen. You appreciate that and you thank them. And you apologize for their... Anything that your guest offers is highly appreciated. Your guest comes with some sweets. Even if it's Something very simple. You appreciate it. You acknowledge it. You lavishly offer your gratitude to them. Why? 
because they're your guests. And a generous host is going to appreciate even the little things that his, his guest does. So therefore, in the month of Ramadan, whatever we do, brothers and sisters, anything we do, reading one ayah of the Qur'an, reading a dua, any small deed, just saying alhamdulillah, looking at your parents with a loving gaze, whatever it may be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He appreciates that. And He thanks us for what we offer. He shows us great love and affection for the little that we do. Why? Because we are His guests. وَدُعَاءُكُمْ فِيهِ مُسْتَجَابٍ And your dua in, in the month of Ramadan is answered. Why is it answered? You know, think of the analogy of the host and the guest. If you have a guest and your guest says, they make a request. You know, do, do you mind if I use your phone? Do you mind if I use your washroom? You know, do you mind if, you know, if I have this, if you, if you can add, if you can make this special tea for me? Whatever your guest asks, even if they ask you for something that you don't have, you will send someone to get it. Why? Because your guest is asking you for something. And a host, a good host, would never ignore the request of his guest. So in the month of Ramadan, when we raise our hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember, you're not just making an ordinary dua, you are making a dua to Allah as his guest. And you say to Allah, Oh Allah, I am the guest that you invited. And I have this request of you. And you are the generous host who would never decline the request of his guest. When we have this understanding, brothers and sisters, it completely changes the experience that you have in the, in the month of Ramadan. So my dear brothers and sisters, as we approach the month of Ramadan, it's important to remember that we are the guests of Allah, not just for one night, not for two nights. Allah has taken us in. It's as if we have entered the house of God. We're in Allah's house, and Allah is our host. And we are His guests for an entire month. What an honor, brothers and sisters, that Allah says, I want to host you for an entire month. Now, Allah's banquet is different from the banquet of kings and emperors. You know, usually when a human being invites you as a guest, when they invite you to a banquet, they offer you food. They tell you, eat. Eat as much as you want. But Allah's banquet is the opposite. Allah says, when you come to my banquet, don't eat. Fast. What kind of banquet tells you don't eat? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what He is offering us in the month of Ramadan is not food for our bodies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give a feast to your soul. And therefore, fasting is like sitting at the table with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you fast, you decenter the body. It's like you're putting the body to rest. And when you suppress the desires of the body, what happens? You activate the soul. When you de-emphasize de the body, you naturally emphasize the soul. You activate the soul. Allah wants to awaken our souls. Allah wants to feed our souls in the month of Ramadan. So the banquet, the divine banquet is what? It's nourishment for your soul. For 11 months, we obsess 
over our physical bodies. We eat day and night and drink day and night. And everything that we just do revolves around tending to the needs of our bodies. Allah in the month of Ramadan, He says, you are my guest. I want to nurture and I want to take care of the real you. And the real you is not, it's not your body. The real you is not your body, brothers and sisters. The real you is your soul. You know, sometimes people say that, you know, I have a soul. No, 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 you don't have a soul. You are a soul. What you have is a body. What you have is a body. And you have this body for a temporary period. You die and this body disintegrates. It decomposes. In fact, even in dunya, your physical body changes. The body that you have today is not the same body that you had 10 years ago. The cells have completely regenerated. It's a totally different body. But you still refer to yourself as I. That I is not the body. The real me is not my body. It's my soul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he wants to activate our souls in this month. Allah wants to feed our starving souls. He wants to nurture our starving souls. So my dear brothers and sisters, in this holy month, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we develop this awareness, that we are so honored that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has invited us. We're not, we're not uninvited guests. We're the invited guests of Allah. And we have the best host. Is there anyone who is a better host than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So with every passing day, continuously remind yourself that for 30 days, Allah is my host. And I am his guest. And one of the best things that you can do as a guest is to, to ask yourself, am I being a good guest? Am I conducting myself in a way that is pleasing to my host? And one of the most important things to keep in mind as you are a guest of Allah in this month is to remember that you are not the only guest of Allah. Every mu'min is a guest of Allah. And one of the things that makes a host happy is when his guest treats the other guests with love and compassion and mercy. And this is important, brothers and sisters. We shouldn't think that it's only me and Allah and I have nothing to do with anyone else. No, no, no. Every person is Allah's guest as well. And if you want to earn the pleasure of Allah, believe me, there is nothing that Allah loves more than when His guests are good to His other guests. I thank you, brothers and sisters, for uh, lending me your ears, uh, for tuning in. Uh, I apologize if I went over the allotted time. I think I, I lost track of time as I was speaking. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Brother Shabir for his gracious uh, introduction. I'd like to thank all of the brothers and sisters who worked tireless, tirelessly behind the scenes. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can reward you for your efforts because only Allah knows about all of the, the, the tasks that were done when there was no audience, when there was no one to acknowledge you. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you for all of those efforts and gives you the strength to continue to hold programs like this. And I pray that all of you have a fruitful and a spiritually uplifting month of Ramadan. And I pray that we are all, we all remember our brothers and sisters in Gaza who, unlike us, they don't have a guarantee of food at the time of Maghrib. You and I, every day we know we have an assurance that I'm going to have iftar today. But there are many innocent people around the world who don't have that type of security. So as we go through the month of Ramadan, and we feel a little bit of that hunger, we need to remember our brothers and sisters in Gaza who are starving, who are dying of starvation, and our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who don't 
have access to food. We have to remember them and we have to pray for them. And most importantly, you know, the month of Ramadan is the beginning of the year. Right? The month of Ramadan is the first month of the new year, according to Ahlul Bayt. It's not the month of Muharram. This was something that was changed by the Umayyads and the enemies of Ahlul Bayt. Absolutely. But we pray that, inshallah, this year is the year that we witness the Zuhur of the Imam. One of the most important things to pray for is the reappearance of Imam Sahib al Zaman. We have to pray for his reappearance. And uh, with that said, uh, I pray that Allah accepts all of your amal. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Thank you, Shaykh, for this uh, beautiful explanation of what it means to be um, a guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Ramadan. Uh, so now we'll start uh, the Q&A session. No. And um, uh, to do that, I'll just uh, explain briefly uh, to, to our audience how they can send in their questions. Okay. Donc, euh, on va maintenant commencer euh, notre euh, session de questions-réponses. Euh, franchement, c'est une opportunité unique qu'on a. Donc, euh, je vous encourage tous à ne pas hésiter, si vous avez la moindre question sur ce qui a été dit ou autre, euh, à poser vos questions. Et pour cela, trois moyens. Soit vous envoyez directement un message au numéro qui s'affiche à l'écran, ou alors de façon anonyme sur le site de Mafia Le Zainab avec le lien qui est à l'écran. Ou encore, euh, vous pouvez euh, flasher le QR code pour euh, envoyer euh, vos questions. Donc, euh, nous attendons euh, vos questions pour euh, la suite euh, du programme. So, Cher, um, we are waiting for the, the first questions uh, to come in. Okay. And meanwhile, um, maybe we can start with the first question um, that I had, which is not directly related to the month of Ramadan, but um, uh, which has to do with the Imam Ali alayhi salam. We often hear in a, a hadith that um, Imam Ali Islam was um, poor, lived as a poor, and um, often that his family um, didn't have uh, so much food to eat. So often they would go hungry, him and his family. But now in Islam, it's also the role of the father, the head of the family, to provide for his family so that his family can live properly without going through um, excessive pain and hardship. So how do you reconcile this? Did Imam Ali al -Islam fail his family by not providing enough for them? Or uh, how does this work? I sent him. That's a very good question. You see, when you look at the, the life and the legacy of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, the Imam spent a significant amount of his time uh, in the battlefields. You know, when Islam was in its infancy, the Imam alayhi salam, he had to go and defend Islam. Meaning that the obligation of defending Islam is naturally going to take priority over everything else. So the Imam alayhi salam, so when, when, when there, during the battles of Islam, you know, these battles are not just, you know, one day. It requires a lot of travel. So the Imam had to spend a significant time away from his family. Now, with that said, that doesn't mean that the Imam alayhi salam neglected his responsibility. In fact, when you look at Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, what you find is that the Imam was a person who I would describe as very high in production, but very low in consumption. Yes. He's high in production, low in consumption. And the Imam alayhi salam, so... We know that the Imam used to dig wells, he used to he used to farm land. But because he's married to Fatima al Zahra, they both understand the importance of living a minimalistic life. Yes. And if there is anything extra, say the Fatima alayhi salam, along with Amir al Mu'mineen, their preference is to neglect themselves as long as other people are looked after. So oftentimes, the periods where they're suffering are these are joint decisions that are being made between Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and Sayyidah Fatima and the house, household of the Prophet. You know, just like with the, the ayah in Surah Al-Insan, when they gave away their loaves of bread, yes. this was not just Imam Ali salam giving away his bread. The entire family was giving away their iftar to those who were less fortunate. 
So Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he was fulfilling his, his responsibility. But whenever he felt that there were those who were more needy, the entire family wanted to make that sacrifice and prioritize the needs of the others. Furthermore, we also have indications in the narrations where Fatima to Zahra would not even bring it to Imam Ali's attention that you know food was running very low. Yeah, but again, so it's, so it's not so it's not that Imam, you know, was doing this you know intentionally. You know, the Imam is relying on say the Fatima to tell him about how much food in the is in the house, but she wouldn't. Because she doesn't want to trouble Amir al-Mu'mineen because he has more important priorities. And that is to protect the Prophet and to protect Islam. So sometimes they would find themselves in, in situations where there's no food available. But not because it's an intentional neglect on the part of Imam Ali. The Imam, the Imam alayhi salam, he keeps a little bit for his family. And whatever extra there is, he would give it to the poor. And Fatima to Zahra... When the food sources are running low, she wouldn't tell Imam Ali ibn Talib, oh Ali, you know, go get food for us because there's nothing. She would never want to overburden him. So when you when you take all of this information uh, and you bring it together, you understand that it's either that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam is simply not being notified by Fatima that, there, that there, there's no food available, or as a family... The family of Amir al muminin they've made a joint, a collective decision to sacrifice their own comfort for others. Okay. Thank you. Um, so let me see if uh, we have more questions coming in. Okay, so uh, here I have um, another question here. Um, which basically says, um, in the world we live in today, uh, how can you reconcile living as a good Muslim, following the the teachings of Islam, and still uh, succeeding um, in this world? Because too often uh, there, there's too many clash points. Um, because if you if you follow um, the teachings of Islam. Basically, people are gonna are, are like pe people are gonna eat you, and you you cannot survive in this world if you um, follow um, step by step everything that Islam teaches. Even Imam Ali Islam, for example, when he was caliph, he's the one who went through most wars, um, uh, whereas the people before him didn't. The caliphs before him. Then I know Imam Ali Islam said, "I know it's because." In, in your time, you have people like me, and in my time, I have people like you. But um, we see that when you apply the precepts of Islam, uh, it becomes very hard to, um, to, to succeed in this world. So how do you do that? That's a very good question. I think that th there is some truth to that statement in, in, in the sense that there are red lines for us as Muslims that don't exist for non-Muslims. For those who don't follow the Sharia, you know, yes, there might be someone who is able to make more money because they're not restricted by the Sharia. That's true, right? You know, because you know they might have more business opportunities. They're able to kind of bend the rules and cheat and lie, and they can at least, from a worldly perspective, it seems that they can get ahead. But I think that the the key concept here is barakah and lack of barakah so for example there might be someone who completely disregards the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for them there's no such thing as a haram transaction everything is halal for them and they're able to generate a lot of money you know they invest in casinos they invest in liquor shops they, you know, they they might have an online business where they they advertise something as brand new, even though it's refurbished. If you do that, there's a good chance that you're going to make a lot of money because you're cheating. But yes. the question is, someone who earns their money in that way, does their money have barakah 
And what I mean by barakah is that, you know, I've met many people in my own life. They are multi-millionaires. Tens of millions of dollars they have. Yes. But there's no barakah in their money. They have, yeah, they have a lot of problems. They have a lot of money, but they, they also have a lot of problems. You know, for example, you, you ask this person, have you ever been to, to Hajj? No, they've never been to Hajj. Even though they have the money. They have so many family problems. They have so many issues. And their money cannot solve any of these issues. They're not allowed, they're not able to do things even though they have a lot of money. And then you might have someone that has less money, but they're able to do a lot. They're able to do a lot of khayr. So barakah, you know, one of the ways that we can define barakah is the ability to do a lot with a little. There are those who have a lot. Yes, they might have a nice house, a nice car, but they're not living a peaceful life. They don't have that sukoon. So I think that we have to also redefine what it means to be successful. So you might have someone who has tens of millions of dollars, but they're internally disturbed. Their families are falling apart. Anything that they... There's no barakah in their money. And then you might have someone who might have a modest income, but because everything that they've acquired is halal and they haven't circumvented the, the, the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah allows them to do a lot with the little that they have. So, yes, there are, there are restrictions. But at the end of the day, I think that as mu'mineen, we, we don't just want money. We don't want wealth. We want wealth that has barakah. And sometimes a little bit of wealth that has a lot of barakah is better than a lot of money that has no barakah. Yes. No. Okay, thank you. So um, I have another question coming in here, um, which asks, which says, um, what is the legislation for um, eating a halal meal that was uh, prepared by a non-Muslim person? A halal meal that was prepared by a non-Muslim, a non-Muslim. I'm assuming someone who's not uh, from Ahlul Kitab. Is that what the the question so, says? So, non-Muslim, but non-Muslim. So, so there are two there are two uh, scenarios here. My assumption, based on the question, is that this person knows that the food is halal. It's yes. halal food, and it's being yeah. handled by non-Muslims. Non-Muslim. So. The only way for this food to become mutanajis is if the person knows that the non-Muslim who's not from Ahlul Kitab, so a non-Muslim who's not Jewish or Christian, say a Buddhist, if they make wet contact with the food, the food has become mutanajis. That's if they're non-Ahlul Kitab. Now, do you have a responsibility to ask if they touch the food with wet hands? You don't have you don't that's you're not you're not obligated to ask. So if there is so as long as you don't know for certain, you can assume that it is ta'al. You can assume that it is ta'al. So sometimes, for example, if I'm invited to to a non-Muslim's house, let's say that I have a Hindu friend, they invite me to their house. And they prepare food. I don't need to go into the kitchen and investigate how they prepared the food. Because I didn't see with my own eyes. I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure that they touched the food with wet hands. I can assume that it's tahir. Because we have a ruling in fiqh that everything is tahir until you know for certain that it is qadr, that it is mutanajis. So as long as that possibility exists... We don't need to complicate things and we can assume that it is tahir and permissible to eat. Thank you. Um, I, I just like you say that I agree with you. Um, but didn't the Prophet himself uh, stay away from things, um, doubtful things? Don't we always say the Prophet, um, when, even when he had a doubt that it was uh, um, uh, haram, najis, not allowed? So, 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 so these are two separate things. So, for example, 
if there is a type of meat, and I don't know, I have doubt, is this halal meat or haram meat? In this situation, I have to be sure. So for example, if there is meat, and I don't know, I have doubt, is this rabbit meat or is this chicken? I'm not allowed to eat it until I'm sure that it is halal meat. That's a situation where I, I have to be sure. But the Prophet ﷺ and the Ahlul Bayt, they have told us that whenever there is a situation where you don't know if something is tahir or najis, because the example that you said that it's halal food, it's either not, it's not meat or it's halal meat for sure. And I now have doubt whether it has become tahir or najis. Ahlul Bayt have told us that in this situation, you can ignore your doubt, okay. you know, especially if you knew the previous state, you knew that it was Tahir, and now you have doubt whether it's Najis or not, your certainty that it was Tahir should not be overcome, overridden by your doubt. Because certainty always overpowers doubt. Okay. Thank you. So, um, now we have... Okay. Thank you. Um, and then one final question I've got here. Um which says, uh, looking for the moon during the month of Ramadan or for Eid, so they say it's, a, it's, it's something personal and that you cannot do the plead of, a, of someone who's not in the same geographical zone as you. So, there are a number of ways to establish the beginning of an Islamic month. If someone, for example, themselves, they see the crescent for the month of Ramadan, if they are, if they see it themselves and they're convinced, they have to act on their knowledge. This is not an issue of taqlid. You know, the reason why the offices of the Maraja they issue statements, they're basically doing people a favor. It's not their job. It's their it's their job to give you the, the general rule of thumb, to give you the methodology. But the methodology is supposed to be applied by the individuals, you know, just like if Sayyidina Sistani gives us the definition of what haram music is, it's not the job of Sayyidina Sistani to tell you this song is halal, this song is haram. The application of the ruling is in the hands of the mukallaf. So a person can determine the beginning of an Islamic month if they, for example, they themselves see the, the crescent or two just mu'mineen give testimony that they saw it that, that testimony can be treated as knowledge or Shia or it is you know learned people pious people have declared that the month has begun and if and that because that report gives you confidence you can act upon it right? so it's not it's not a matter of taqlid or not taqlid. you know it, it could be taqlid in the sense that you're following uh what Mu'mineen and learned people have said and it's it's become so widespread that it's it gives you confidence that the month has set in or it can be through your own you know viewing your own knowledge or it can be relying on the testimony of uh two mu'mineen two righteous uh believers okay. wow. so, it, so it really goes to the back to this idea of knowledge or you have a you have a level, level of itminan that the month has has begun. Okay. Well, I think uh, that's uh, that was our final question. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Azhar Nasser, for uh, being with us uh, tonight here in Paris. I know it's the morning for you over there. Um, so. I, thank you so much once again. And uh, I know this time was uh, was through Zoom, but uh, I pl I pray that inshallah. In the near future, we get to have an in-person program uh, in Paris, if it's possible. Inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakumullah, everyone, and please keep me in your du'a. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.